works out. I want to give away a couple of books to some special people. Um, are there any user experience designers in the room? Cool. Can you please stand up? We got one. That's it. Two, three, four, five, six, seven. Okay, please stand up. Okay. How many of you are left handed? The right handers sit down. None? <laughs> okay, how about uh, UX designers born in March? None? Okay, how about. Okay, two. Okay, thank you. This thing's coming off, guys. I just passed this. Can you pass this to Are you the UX designer born in March? Yes. All right, come after for an autograph. Is that, where's the other one? You? No? Yeah? <laughs> Thank you. I feel like I'm like Bono of you 2 walking out into the audience all of a sudden. Is this thing still working even though it's not on my ears because it feels okay? So I have a third book that I want to give away and I heard that Europeans don't tweet, but um, we tweet in America and um, the tweet hashtags and at signs are here. And so anyone who um, tweets at least three times with uh, a quote of me saying that something ridiculous or stupid or funny um, and a photo um, to especially UX strategy, um, if the first person that does three of those gets the third free book, all right? So feel free to have fun with that. Um, and please come up to me. I'm going to be selling them either. I have like 16 books left here or outside. I'm not sure. But maybe we'll see how that goes. OK, so um, let me tell you a little bit about myself before I launch right into what is UX strategy. Um, I've been at doing software design for over 25 years when I started. Um, Back in, I guess, 1990, I did my master thesis at NYU at ITP, and it was a floppy disk magazine, the first one ever uh, distributed on a floppy disk. It was programmed in HyperCard and VideoWorks. Um, this is before the web, and so um, it was a big to-do to try to um, mash up a bunch of stuff like crazy sound samples from bands I liked, like Sonic Youth and weird art that I stole from fanzines and games, and, uh, but then I ran into more complications because they're really, I didn't want to just distribute them to dorks on BBSs. I wanted them to go to my, you know, my peers who were shopping at independent bookstores. So I was faced, you know, maybe I had made a really cool product and, uh, where no one else had seen it before, but I still had to get the product into bookstores and record stores. And so all of a sudden I had to learn a little bit about packaging and marketing. And I did a series of these electronic magazines and sold them for $6 at bookstores, art galleries, and people started writing articles. And that was, this was my first product. And then one day, um, this rock star um, at the time named Billy Idol walked into a bookstore in Los Angeles. And I don't know what he was doing there because he doesn't really read, but he bought one of my, one of my discs and he went back to the record company and said, I've got to have one of these with my new album. And his record company called me, and that was how I got my first commercial product. They took, they said, we want to create a disc taking his art, and that basically was a save as was my first piece of software. And it was distributed worldwide um, with his album called Cyberpunk. And that was sort of my first big claim to fame with the disc magazine heyday. And so, as I mentioned, I started getting press, and w one of the big ones was Newsweek magazine. This dates back to 1995. And if you look at it, it's kind of amusing, because over here, that's Mark Andreessen. Have you heard him? He invented this thing called the web browser. You've probably seen it, right? And he's little over there, right? Then there's me over here, big, with the skateboard, right? And so I think what that shows is that people have always been pretty um, interested, at least in terms of like hype and in, in kind of people who are like doing the cool stuff, you know? I mean, he was, he was kind of dorky. Um, he did something way more important than I did. 
Um, but they, they were really excited to have, you know, somebody who, you know, looked like, hey, we're doing something that's innovative and exciting and cool. And so that, um, that's pretty much where I started um, many, 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 many years ago. And so now I'm grown up, kind of. And as mentioned, I teach at USC. I teach a class called UX Strategy and Design. And um, it's on Mondays, so I have to get, fly back tonight and teach it tomorrow. It's great. And then I also finished this book called UX Strategy. And I wrote the book because I'd been teaching 20 years. And I uh, had been hounded by students um, who always wanted like my slide decks, or they wanted my templates, or they wanted presentations, or anything that was about strategy. Because there's so many books about UX design. And I felt like there was just like so little knowledge out there about what user experience strategy was because it was a new thing. And um, I had already felt like I got as far as I could with consulting and everything. And I really wanted to just delve into a subject and learn everything about it and write a book. And so I spent two years writing this book and getting this publisher, O'Reilly, which is a big tech publisher, and now it's on Amazon. Woohoo! So that's me. Um, but, you know, I started essentially as an interface designer back in the 90s, and then it evolved, the term became interaction designer and information architect, and then now they call that user experience designer, and it's, um, the definition of it has evolved to include lots of different Venn diagrams with lots of circles, so you can feel like, oh, I'm doing all this great stuff, whether it's uh, information architecture and user research or visual design or, you know, they'll throw everything under the kitchen sink in there um, to say, you know, this is part of the user experience of a digital product. But um, what it comes down to is that you're working usually in a group of a small people, you know, a small team of other designers in a creative environment, whether it be an agency or a startup or an enterprise at a whiteboard or sketching or something and doing what we call ideation and drawing boxes on a whiteboard and erasing other people's boxes and trying to come up with different ideas. And I know you developers probably get to do a lot of UI too. And it's a pretty easy gig and so I was doing user experience design after the dot com crashed and I had moved back to LA. And at that point, um, you know, I'd already been a big shot CEO and stuff like that and I really had to humble it become humble and start over from scratch, you know, and go through the roller coaster of technology, because it, like right now we're in a bubble again and it could crash and, you know, so at that, that time I started at working out of this weird postmodern building in Los Angeles and as just a UX designer, <laughs> and even though I'd done product strategy and they said, hey, how would you like to lead the discovery phase for this really big television property? And I was like, fuck yeah, this sounds great. And so they um, hired me, uh, excuse me, they elevated me to the lead UX person to do this, what was called, it's called now UX strategy, but the discovery phase for Oprah.com. Oprah is this big, um, now she's a very famous billionaire, but she used to have a television show and you know that had millions and millions of people, especially women that watched it. And so they had been had a static website, and they needed to redo this massive website with this large existing um, audience, so that it was more, uh, you know, 2005 or whatever it was. And so they said, "Okay, we're going to give you a one-week discovery phase period." Um, so they flew us out to Chicago, um, where we sat with a bunch of contentious, bitchy stakeholders, and I had to. Um, work with another lead where we tried to get consensus. We tried to get the stakeholders um, who all cared about their different agendas to um, come to agreement on what was the most important thing about this website, what should be on the, on the home page, what should be in the navigation. And so you, you, know, you do all these exercises. If you're interested in exercises, uh, like doing collaborative exercises, there's another great O'Reilly book called Game Storming. And um, we did a couple different ones where, you know, with the sticky notes and you give everybody a sticky note and they write what's most important. You have them put it up on, on a whiteboard and, and then you uh, raise the ones that are the most important to the, what, it, what you hear on the left side, what's core, trying to figure out, well, there's one approach. Or you do these target boards and say, you know, what's in the middle and, and, look, and, and then you take photos of them and you bring them back. 
And um, then uh, they give you all these demographics. You know, by, by this time, personas had been adapted by big trendy agencies. And they weren't quite the personas described by Alan Cooper, where you'd go out and do ethnography and study people for three months and have empathy. These were the personas that were done by agencies where they give you a bunch of marketing data about their customers and you create a fake persona. So we had Susie Suburbia, Uma Urban, um, and this chick, uh, Gretchen the Grandma. And basically these were fake people who just were a mix of a white person, a Mexican person, an African American person of different age brackets and different uh, you know, middle class, upper class. But they were bullshit. I never met these people. I never watched them use the website. Um, I wasn't, I had seen the show, but it's like I really didn't get to understand what these customers wanted. We were re redoing a site, and so we turned this in. And one week later, bam, they approved it, and for six months, we were doing this. And it was a lot of wireframing. I had a team of four people, and we had to write not just functional specification, but technical specification, because of course they wanted to save money and outsource it to Russia and have them um, build the whole thing. And so we had to like write out every little thing so that there wouldn't be any um, misunderstandings about the logic of how a button would work. And it was a big, huge, um, you know, way for schematic to make lots of money and for my team to just want to be bored and the, and the stakeholders would just go back to fighting about what should be on the home page and on the different landing pages. And I was pretty disgusted. By the time the site launched, I never looked at it again. And I was like, this, is, this seems very unright, this process, you know? Because basically all the UX designers, all the developers and all the designers, visual designers were blind. You know, they were blind to the business goals. They were blind to who the actual customers were. And so I thought, you know, this whole thing's a farce. You know, this, this can be improved. So what is UX strategy? There were several books um, that were exploring kind of ideas around it, um, but nothing really that defined it. And so I've done a lot of research, and I've distilled it down to basically it's the intersection of business strategy and um, user experience design. And I made this like little version for any five-year-olds out there that don't quite understand what an intersection is, where it's where these two things come together. And it's basically the three little like thought bubbles that come out of that are to understand it. It's a plan of action that you're trying to ascertain um, the user, what the user experience of the product is that is aligned with the business objectives. What is the business trying to do? Are they trying to get more customers? Are they trying to make more money? Are they trying to scale out to more products? Um, it's an understanding between the designers and the goal of, 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 the, of who's responsible um, for the product surviving, right? Because if we just go and work for companies and work behind like little wireframe monkeys and developers and have no idea how this product's making money, then we're, we're kind of posers, you know? It's like, oh, wow, it's just a job. But it, we, we need to care, I think, whether whatever work environment in terms of the product being successful because what you want our companies to be successful. So it's also a method. You know, this, this is a big one in that we want to validate that uh, the solution that we come up with, our new product, um, actually resonates with the customers. It's something that they want. It's a problem that needs to be solved. Um, this is called product market fit. And this is something that constantly needs revisiting because guess what, the product, the, the market is dynamic. It constantly is changing. And so we need to keep up with it and our products need to evolve with it. And when you just get right down to the brass tacks, it's a practice that if done correctly, it's a much better guarantee um, for a digital product than just crossing your fingers, doing some wireframes, and writing a bunch of code. So let me, I'm gonna explain um, how I came up with the framework and give you a business case to give you more context. So the basic practice requires of UX strategy that you spin a bunch of plates like a magician. And the plates that are the most key are these four. Business strategy, value innovation, validated user research, and then having killer UX. 
to come up with a really stellar strategy. You want to be really working the techniques that make up these four tenets. So I want to give you a business case of a product platform I hope everybody's heard of. Um, I think it's worldwide. Is most people familiar with Airbnb? Right, They're, they've done pretty well for themselves. So if we go back in a time machine to 2007 and we wanted to sublet an apartment, this is what the experience was like. We um, would go to Craigslist, we would click on sublets and temporary, let's pretend you wanted to come to visit me in Los Angeles and of course you're a tourist and you're like, ooh, I want to stay in Venice. And so you'd get this ad, really beautiful ad here with lots of information um, that's helpful. It's $39 a night and we just call Chantanelli with the number and no text please. And that's, you know, hopefully she'll probably tell us to transfer the money to her account um, and maybe when we show up, um, she'll be there. Maybe there'll be no apartment building. Um, that'll, that could be a scenario, or maybe we'll get there and it'll be like a drug skanky hole. Um, or maybe from her perspective, we'll show up and we'll be creeps, you know, and we'll destroy her apartment. So there, it's like this completely, um, this system that just like has a lot of risk built into it and it's just full of pain points. So now compare that to this other product that comes out um, in, it's much different, the experience. We type in Venice, all of a sudden we get a result set. This is what I would consider killer UX. And if you look at it and you start deconstructing it, you'll see that they're, just, they've, and I'm sure you've seen this, they, they've basically taken a lot of just great ideas from other sites like Yelp on the top left where you can see where the restaurants are in Yelp um, on a map, so if I wanted to stay in Venice, right by the beach, I could pick a place, I could say I want my own place, I want a private room, I can narrow it down by prices, which is like how Kayak used the slider, they show the listings, you can even see people you know who know the people that rented it. But if you, as, you, as you go through the process of trying to find a sublet, it just, you get more and more information about it. So you get your photo gallery, you, get, you can see tons of pictures. Airbnb has done something very innovative where they offer uh, people who have Airbnb, Airbnbs uh, a free photographer to come to your house to make the most, uh, the, take the most uh, best pictures that they possibly can so that these don't look like scummy hell holes that they might be, but beautiful, you know, really well taken shots that show off the entire apartment. You can put captions. And then you have the people uh, who are actually are renting the place. And this is the most important part because now we're building trust, right? Which is very important. Like if we think about eBay and we look at the, how many stars somebody has, you know, if they have 53, are we gonna buy something from them? Probably not, you know, it may not come. Um, same with, with a lot of, you know, Amazon reviews. You know, these, th this building of trust into the product is absolutely essential. And it goes for both sides of the market. So. I saw that they had 47 reviews. I mean, and you can also wonder, like think about the customer base of Airbnb that these 80 year old rich, he's a for, uh, you know, retired attorney and she's an art dealer. Like they're just kind of having fun renting out. They want people to see their art in their loft downstairs. So they look at my profile and they're like, she looks kind of safe and cool. She's a mom, she's a teacher, she's got a cat. She's got a couple of reviews. So they said, sure Jamie, you could rent our place for 110 bucks and the transaction went through our banks. And if you compare that just from the business strategy perspective, which was the first plate that we saw, um, what, are, what, are we, what are we comparing it against? Like very different types of competitors. We talked about um, the Craigslist at the bottom, or we could go stay in a hotel. I don't think it would be $110 for me to stay in San Francisco in a hotel. I would have been way far away from the launch conference, which was in a uh, closer to the mission, or I could go to VRBO or HomeAway, which were these more uh, subletting platforms that didn't have a transaction system based in. So from the business strategy standpoint, they really um, did something that was unique. From the value innovation standpoint, um, what they did is they made it so that it was something that increased, that, ha that gave better value not to just the customers who were subletting, excuse me, who were subletting the, the places, but to the cus customers who were the hosts, the subletties. I'm a host on Airbnb. 
I have someone right now in, I have a guest house. I made $1,800 yesterday with him sitting out there while I was sitting here. Um, and yeah, I could have rented it out on Craigslist, but he's like a Caltech professor and the money just goes into my account and it's frictionless. And this kind of money was what was going into my account every few months while I was writing the book and I had no other way to make income because I could not write and consult at the same time I had to focus. So what they've done is they've created value for two sides of the market. They've created value for the host for the, and for the guests. And that's what's called value innovation. And that's, you know, we can see that with Uber and, and lots of, and Fiverr and, and different two-sided marketplaces. In terms of validated research, how, how they started was basically, you know, they first did, they, you know, the product starts in phases. So they were first like, oh, the founders were like, let's just rent out an air mattress in our house and see how that goes. And then they were like, we really need to do this in the real world. So the Democratic Convention was coming to Denver. 20,000 people were going to come in. They knew there was only enough hotel space for 8,000, so they went to tons of uh, people who would be open to renting out their apartments or rooms in their apartment and concierge, like a concierge is someone who you meet at, the, at a hotel in Paris and make sure that everything's going, you know, that you're okay, you have everything you need. They concierge the business process of uh, how would you get in, would everything be there, would there be a fork and a knife and a kitchen and, and everything that you would need and made and, and went through all the steps to to learn about how this product would actually work in the real world because there was more than just an interface for a transaction. There's a lot of our products take place online, but then there's an offline component. So they did this experiment and it was wildly successful and they came back to San Francisco and Y Combinator brought them in and they got tons of funding and that's when they started scaling starting out of San Francisco where the early adopters would really go for it and there's also tons of people like me who were coming there and yeah, I'll give this thing a shot. But what they ultimately did, this is the killer UX part, is they made something that was frictionless. All our products that we should make should be frictionless, meaning painless, like they're so easy to use. They're addicted, they're addictive, they're simple. Anybody like my dad can now pick up his phone and push a button and take an Uber to an airport, you know, and it's like, before that, if I told my dad that he was getting in a stranger's car and going to the airport, he'd be like, oh, I'm hitchhiking? You know, and I was like, no, dad, now you're getting some, some weirdo with a Prius's car and, you know, and the money's gonna come out of your credit card and ka-ching, ka-ching, ka ka he gets a $30 ride to the airport instead of a $90 taxi and the guy who gave him the ride makes money too. And um, it's these types of experience that are enabled by the products and the platforms that we're making that I'm personally the most excited about. Um, and I think the market also shows that there's a lot of excitement bringing two different types of customers together. You know, Airbnb, this is actually old from TechCrunch, but I mean, $10 billion valuation, they're changing the world, they've disrupted, they've completely disrupted ho um, how hotels, um, how many guests are staying in hotels, certainly in all the big cities and how people sublet and how people are all of a sudden turning their hotels into hostels. Um, and that's what's really exciting to me about these products is when they change the world, when they make things easier and cheaper and more efficient. So let's look at them now just kind of understanding um, from a foundational standpoint. Business strategy for those with an MBA, it's very obvious, you know, it's the identification of the guiding principles of your company. What is, how do you want your company to be perceived? Um, what are its objectives for making money, for scaling, right? We have a, a startup um, in an infancy stage, it's just still trying, it's like a little baby trying to figure out how to walk, right? And then once all of a sudden it has a product that it either has a large customer base or it actually has customers, then it becomes a real business and it needs to have a business strategy. If you look at traditional business strategy and you start reading Michael Porter stuff, he's a Harvard business professor, old school guy, and he wrote this book back in the 80s um, that basically looked at you know, how a business is, needs to win. They need to have a competitive advantage and there's two types of competitive advantage. And I know you may not know some of these uh, references in here, so I'll explain them. Um, one, um, one way to win is by cost leadership. 
I'm going to have cheaper, uh, more affordable stuff, right? So Walmart, which is like this big, gross, disgusting store, but has like all, they hand select the best, you know, like two different types of TVs to choose from, and, and then paper towels. They want to have every brand of paper towel, but like the ones that they deem, and they, and their whole way of setting up their business is so that it's all about them making the most money and opening up these stores all over rural America so that it's a one-stop shop. And ultimately, how does Main Street compete with them? You know, and so that is called cost leadership. It's not even with big stores, it's thinking about like all around here, all these cafes, some of these cafes are maybe competing and it's like which ones uh, have ch or the price is, is less, or maybe it's it's um, going to to get like any any you know a pizza slice or or whatever it is where all of a sudden the price just keeps getting lower and lower and that's how the businesses are competing in that particular vertical. That's not interesting to us as software designers. What's far more interesting and how we can win is by differentiation. Differentiation is basically how you're different and unique from all your competitors. So Starbucks, Howard Schultz came to Italy. He was like, whoa, wow, Italy's so cool. You walk in, you smell the beans. Like, they're like doing this heavy thing with uh, making the espressos. And people are, and God, I know the cafe culture here is massive. You know, it's like a real part of your culture. And he, instead in America, people would go to McDonald's or, or to, to a donut shop or in New York to a bodega and they'd buy a 50 second, excuse me, 50 cent uh, coffee and that was the experience um, of getting a cup of coffee and he totally transformed it. He transformed this coffee, co coffee culture to America and it became a very successful franchise that's now around the world that's really just based on all of a sudden you'll walk in there and spend five dollars for a crappa frappuccino, you know, but it's a basic coffee that tastes really good in a fancy cup with a slip that you walk out and they play hipster music and you hang out and there's wireless and it's so, so different than having a cup of coffee for 50 cents at McDonald's. And so what we're talking about here are value propositions. A value proposition is a promise of value to be delivered um, to the customer. It's what their expectation, what they want. Um, when they think of your product, what they're expecting to get from it. So if you look at two very similar products, the Audi and the BMW, they almost look the same, these two black, gorgeous uh, black BMW German expensive cars, but even they have different, slightly different value propositions that go to slightly different customer segments. I used to be an Audi driver, I was more sporty, um, you know, going through a midlife crisis, um, you know, wanted to be progressive and sophisticated, and then I was like, oh, I think I actually want to be a douchebag BMW driver now, and I switched over. The value prop of a more performance ultimate driving machine was what was more appealing to me, you know, and, and so that's what's really interesting about value props is the customer base changes over time. If you think about Facebook, on who used Facebook back in the day, and who, I know you still use it now here, and not so much Twitter, but like, who uses Facebook in the States are older, like my mom's on Facebook. And um, it's really interesting how they have to like change their feature set and make it easier and appeal so their value prop can reach a broader audience. And so what that differentiation is really about, when we start thinking about products, we're not talking about brands and with digital products because the brand is the experience of the darn product, right? And the experience, if we're shifting the experience of how someone, how one day getting into a stranger's car goes from hitchhiking to Ubering, that's because we've changed the mental model. And that's what we want to do if we're creating disruptive products. If we look at just the mental model of getting cash, a mental model are the steps that we have, that we think that we need to take to get something done. And typically, if for digital products, it involves an interface, and then what happens offline, the business process that allows that to, make, to happen. Like Uber is a really, and Airbnb, but particularly Uber was something very challenging because they had to find the drivers, figure out how they would pay them, figure out like insurance. There was like so many aspects to making products work behind the scenes. And so 
when you, when you try to get a mental model that shifted from something like, what, I'm going to rent out strangers in my house, or I'm going to drive somebody around in my car and be a taxi driver when you're an artist, or whatever, whatever you're using. I'm going to send naked pictures of myself over Snapchat to my boyfriend, but it's OK because the picture will disappear in a minute. It's shifting the mental model of how we think something should work. And I love this example because in, when I was 10 years old in 1976, I, to get cash, I would think that, well, you go with, with your mom to the bank and we wait in line at the teller and she fills out a, a slip, um, um, a withdrawal slip, and she gives it to the teller lady and then the teller lady gives her back cash. That was how you got cash back in the 70s. And then when I went away to college, um, all of a sudden, you know, the last thing my dad gave me was this ATM card and I had to go up to the machine when I needed cash and type in a PIN number and then out came the cash. My mental model changed. I didn't have to go to the bank or the lady or deal with her anymore. I could just go to this machine and know this number. Now, um, you can, I hear, uh, this would have been a picture of Trader Joe's in, in America, but you have these stores. Is this true? They give you cash back. You buy something and then all of a sudden they give you cash back. So now how we want to get cash, our mental model has shifted. And it's shifted with around the business process. So if we look at these value props um, of digital products, especially the ones that are extremely successful, Airbnb, Snapchat, and Waze, awesome products, these are how the, the founders of these products pitched their products before they actually, maybe they had prototypes or, or small, or initial you know, beta versions of them to raise funding. This is not how we describe Airbnb or Snapchat necessarily, but this was their promise of value so that they could raise funding and say, this is, you know, it's a community marketplace for people to discover book and unique, book unique places around the world. Uh, Waze is a social traffic and navigation app based on the world's largest community. Like, and they're differentiating themselves from their competitors with these value props. And we need to really understand the value prop of the product we're making. Otherwise, we're just monkeys, OK? So who are, if we're going to make a product, we need to say, OK, this product is intended to do this. So who are my direct competitors of my value proposition? There's two types of competitors, actually, direct competitors and indirect competitors. And they're both eating some of our dinner. And so we need to like, get them away from the table as fast as possible by doing something different. The direct competitors are the scariest because they are literally the ones that are already delivering our solution in some way. And our opportunity to make it better, more efficient, either as developers or designers, is, is to make it easier to use, to make it faster, to have more of whatever it needs on there. And so we need to look and study all of uh, who are direct competitors out there so we understand what they're doing, what features they offer, how big they are, um, you know, how, how much funding they have. We want to know everything about them. Um, the indirect competitors are also very interesting because we can glean all kinds of nuggets of amazing features from them. We can see how they're leveraging social media. We can learn because they're, they're taking a piece of our market. For example, I did the strategy for ABC because I live in LA, so it's a lot of TV stuff. They're a big television network in Los Angeles based out of LA. And so when we did their strategy, they're like, oh, just look at NBC and CBS and take all their features and we'll just do everything but better. And it's like, oh, great. So it's like this massive site full of a bunch of features that most people don't use. And that's not, that's not how you beat the competitors, especially if you're thinking about, well, you're, you're stealing eyeballs. You're stealing people away from other places. They're not, so you got to think outside of the mental model of, are they watching TV? What, what else are they watching? Well, well, guess what, ABC idiots? They're also watching YouTube. I mean, now YouTube is eating ABC's dinner. All those, all those guys are going to die unless their content, uh, you know, they can do whatever they want with their content. But my 10-year-old son doesn't watch any of the traditional television um, media companies that I watched as a kid. He watches YouTube, and he watches 16-year-olds play video games. That's his content. Um, I would say that's an indirect competitor that now is a direct competitor to ABC. Did you notice that their value prop changed over time and the content has changed over time? Um, Huffington Post, that was another 
you know, competitors. Like basically you have to really think like who are people, how are, are people solving the problem that we want to solve um, that we can like, you know, com that we need to know that we, we're covering it so that we're not losing our customer base to them. And so I created a UX strategy toolkit that you can get from me for free. Uh, I'll give you the link to that at the end. Um, and one of the most important tools on there, and they're basically spreadsheets, is called, it's a competitive analysis tool. And basically you take your competitors' names, you plop them in there. First I teach you how to find them, if you don't know how to find them. And then you start tracking you know, their URLs so you can figure out um, you know, and share this with the team. It's a Google Doc. It should be done by everybody. I think like people who um, think, oh, we'll have the strategists do this or the stakeholders. Everybody on the team could be doing this type of research and become subject matter experts in the field and know what all your competitors are doing. And so we look at all of these different things. We create the purpose of the site and try to figure out all the information out there so we know what's being done so we don't reinvent the will. Otherwise, we're like, these guys, the mythical ostrich that buries its head in the sand and is just like, oh, you know, like, oh, I'm just going to make my thing and it's going to be better than everyone else and I don't care. I don't know. Like, how many of us know stakeholders like that? They think their idea is original and they don't want to hear about anything going on in the marketplace. Or how many developers are like that? They think like, oh, I'm just going to make this thing, even though there's another chat system or there's another, um, you know, photo sharing thing that does exactly what he's doing and he could simply look at it and see the user experience and see how great or how sucky it is and just rip it off and it'd be so much faster. And it's a best practice. Why are we retraining our users to do something that already exists? And so I think it's extremely important that we understand our marketplace. The second thing is value innovation. And this is our opportunity to make a product that has unique value and focus on the primary utility. What is it that we're creating that is different, right? And so this concept of value innovation uh, I got from Blue Ocean Strategy. This book came out 10 years ago. Um, recommended reading, it's kind of boring, um, but it does look at a lot of business cases, historical companies that have been around for over 100 years that have won by creating a blue ocean. They call it a blue ocean as opposed to a red ocean. A red ocean is full of sharks, and all these sharks are just attacking each other, and it's full of blood, and it's just gross. You don't want to swim out into a red ocean full of products that do exactly what you want to do and compete in that market. No, you want to go into a nice blue ocean that's open, an uncontested market where there's opportunity and you can like start your product where there's not a hundred people doing what you're doing and grow your product and do kinds of experiments and take um, more risk than just like, oh wow, it has to be as good as these 10 other things. And so it's not just about the product, it's about changing these mental models and changing the world along with it so that they understand why this product is essential. So a classic example of a blue ocean company is the Ford Model T. Um, when Ford, back in the day, way back in the day, in 1908, most people didn't own cars. They were really, for rich people, they were super expensive and you would get around the cities on horse and buggy and you'd be lucky if you had family out in the suburbs. Maybe you could take a train. But it was very, very rare for anyone to own a car. And so Ford thought, well, how, what if I just came up with just one type of car? You know, instead of it being custom, we'll just have one car. It'll be called the Model T. It'll be black. And then we'll create an assembly line that basically has a bunch of machines and they each do you know, one different thing. And the cars that go through the assembly line and started just like pumping out this cars. He created jobs. He created an entire new business process that essentially made it. So now we all can have cars. The cars that he created were $800. He totally changed the way people lived their lives. All of a sudden they could see their families. They could own a car and go um, and have control of their life. And so it's these ideas that, to me, are super inspiring, where you're completely changing the way that something can be done, how people think of things. And so value innovation is essentially this diamond in the middle. You're bringing the buyer value up, and you're bringing the cost down. 
that's what we want to get to. Is we want to, it's, it's like when we thought about Michael Porter and the two, uh, competitive advantages of lower cost and differentiation, well, here we're going to try to do both because it's really hard to just compete with lower cost when we're creating products that are free. I mean, how many apps do we download that are free? How do you win on free? You can't. You, you can't just win with monetarily until someone buys you out. You have to win by creating something that's so killer that you just have more customers than all the other competitors, and then someone like Google or Facebook or whoever buys you, and that's, that's how you get the money. So a lot of startups, I work with tons of startups in the States, they don't, they're not like concerned with, oh, we're gonna sell 2,000 apps for $3. Like, that's small-minded. It's like, no, how are we gonna growth hack the shit out of this app so that we have so many people coming on board, using it, and coming back constantly? And so this value innovation is this utility of your product that you think um, will go out there and disrupt the market. So disruption and innovation, these are, uh, if you see my laptop, you'll see disruptive innovation is the new punk rock. Um, it's an expression that I love because I feel like it's like this is our chance to do something extremely punk rock and different and cool. And there's two types of disruption. There's sustaining, oh, excuse me, two types of innovation, sustaining innovation and disruptive innovation. So you may work at a startup and you can try to do something that disrupts the marketplace, that changes mental models, um, that is completely unique. But maybe you work at an enterprise and you can be only so much intrapreneurial as opposed to entrepreneurial. Now you're in a business, you know, you can only do so much. And sustaining innovation, there's an existing market, you understand who the customer is, but you can still innovate at the same time. You know, so it, it's like don't feel so hamstrung if you work at a place and you feel like you can't make big change, find opportunities to do small change. So these are examples of super disruptive 21st century companies. Um, I'm sure you've heard of a lot of them, but Kickstarter is like how companies, you know, raise money for all kinds of products. Totally changed the world. Tinder is like a dating hookup site um, that's very popular in the States because, you know, you don't even need to like, you just like um, sign in with your Facebook profile and start swiping left and right and you have a date in two minutes instead of having to go through a laborious profile, you know, and writing people, you know, ways change the way that we navigate um, by making it so that users are actually contributing to uh, wh where are the traffic patterns, how can I take shortcuts, and this Israeli company sold their company to Google uh, Maps for a billion dollars, so Google is like, we don't want to compete with these guys, we'll just swallow them up. And that seems to be the pathway for a lot of companies, is they get, swall they get bigger and bigger. We'll probably see Uber by Lyft, you know, in the next six months, they'll just swallow it up. And if you look at the value innovation for a lot of products, I tried to figure out, like, is there a secret recipe? What are the different ways that we can, um, you know, get to value innovation when we're creating a new product or modifying an existing product? And typically it's adding something on or taking something away that makes it just simpler to use and easier to use. So if you think about Meetup, back in the day, uh, not very far back, like Meetup now allows you to charge money for Meetups, but they didn't until Eventbrite came along and kicked their butt. Um, they, meetup, you can organize an event, but you couldn't charge for it. So Eventbrite now allows people to, you know, just put in a transactional system. So people like me, I have workshops around the world, I can organize my own event. It's not a meetup with some dorky group that is, you know, like here's all over here. It's like, no, this is my event. It's a one-off event. I'll do it in LA and I'll charge this much money for it and then I just duplicate the page and now it's in San Francisco and now it's in Tel Aviv. And they created a way, a completely innovative product by just taking the concept of like, I can start a group or I can start, have an event and add trans transactions to it and made something that's made life so much better for a lot of people, particularly me. Um, it helped me a lot get a book deal because I was able to have enough sold out workshops to prove to my publisher that there was actually traction, interest in the market, and UX strategy. So it's, it's a great way, and I know other authors that have done the same thing. I used Eventbrite in the same way. Google Maps, I mentioned, added crowdsourcing equals ways. Um, and sometimes it's just consolidating. You know, like who would want to compete with YouTube? 
But then all of a sudden we have Vine that's like, wow, it is such a pain in the butt to take, make a video, upload it to YouTube, and then share it with grandma. Like now you just open up the app, push down, let release, and ka-ching, it's like up in the sky and broadcasted to your social network. Just simplicity. Um, a good way, an exercise that I talk about in the book for teams to just focus on the value innovation is to just use a storyboard. Storyboards are used typically in animation or in advertising for figuring out like what is our pitch. Well, I use them with my teams to figure out what is our value innovation. Before we start building out a prototype or an MVP, we just figure out, well, what are the main key features that we have to go to? Um, and you know, for this one, we came up with a product called Airbnb for weddings. So we splintered out a slice of Airbnb and said, what if we had a product where, because weddings are very expensive in LA, the venues are extremely expensive. What if people rented out their homes on, in Malibu, let's say, where everybody wants to have a wedding on the beach, that's like the fantasy thing. Um, and how could we make that work? What would be the steps along the way? And we just basically you know, grabbed from a bunch of different websites and hodgepodge the concept together just to figure out what would be the steps to, so that we could then show this to the stakeholders and say, here's what we think is the primary utility of the product and have them engage in something that isn't looking at a bunch of wireframes or even a crazy prototype that they have to go like this with. It's like, let's just look at this thing and figure this out. Third tenant is called validated user research. And this is the concept of not just doing plain old vanilla ice cream user research. We want to measure. We want to look, treat our experiment, uh, product as an experiment. We want to make sure that we can uh, measure when we show the prototype or the MVP or the first uh, release of the product to our hypothesized customers and get signal back that they actually want to use this. This concept has been around for a while, but it became extremely popularized by Eric Ries with his awesome book, The Lean Startup. And if you're interested in startups and you haven't read this book, then I would buy it right now, immediately, and listen to it, um, especially if you're interested in agile development, because it takes this concept of um, we're going to do smaller things and do them sooner. And for him, it became about this concept of build, measure, and learn. And so that you would figure out what's the idea of the product in the smallest, simplest form that we can make. And then we'll build just that piece, not 100 features, but the two that are required. That'll be our product, what we deem the product. And then how we have to have a way to measure it. Otherwise, what are we learning? We're just making subjective concepts that may not be true. We have to get back data, empirical data. We learn from that, and we keep going through these cycles so that we're constantly getting to this point where we have what uh, Mark Andreessen called product market fit. And Eric Ries didn't invent it. He took a lot of um, you know, insights from these other books. Um, Steve Blank is an amazing entrepreneur out of Silicon Valley. He wrote The Four Steps to the Epiphany, and that's all about customer discovery and customer acquisition. And there's a lot of books about this, but this is kind of the holy grail about like how to make products, and it's a strategy book as well. It's pretty thick and boring. Um, but at the same time, you can go through it, and, and it talks about you know, the stages of, of bringing on customers and, and, and how to really build a direct channel to them. And then if you think about About Face, if you've heard of Alan Cooper, he wrote, he was the guy that came up with the personas. And he, by his third edition of uh, About Face, he, he did an about face on personas. Instead of it being this thing where we're going to study people and uh, go out into the field and research and ask them questions and, and develop empathy with them and, and feel for them, no, we're going to uh, actually learn about the problem that they, need, that they need solving and make sure that they are the actual customer that we want. And that is because we're trying to, again, think about what we're making with an experimental mindset, not a closed mind. And this came, is a quote from Clayton Christensen, you know, one of the guys who talked most about disruptive animation, you know, that uh, the premature outlay of huge amounts of money in pursuit of the wrong strategy is a thing to avoid. You need to have an experimental mindset. And there's a really cool group in uh, the States 
uh, called the Lean Startup Machine. And all they do is they go from city to city and they bring hackers and entrepreneurs and designers and all together <clears throat> to come up with a fake product over a weekend and figure out like how fast can we go out and pitch this, find customers, and actually get do one transaction and just teach this concept that um, we're experimenting. We're not saying this is the solution until we've validated that we know who our customer is and we know what their problem is. So this experiment obviously needs to be, you know, a scientific, and so it starts with having a hypothesis. Instead of saying, I know, it's like, well, I hypothesize. When we hypothesize, these are assumptions that we're making, and they're not true until we've proven them true. So if your stakeholder says something, oh, I think this product's going to do this, you don't want to just call them a liar or an idiot. Instead, you want to say, hmm, okay, that's an interesting idea, and you think I have a different idea, so you have to go out yourself and study the market and study the customers and go talk to the customers and show that you've measured them, measured their reaction when you talked about the problem, and then measured the reaction when you showed them the solution. Because most of the time, we're invalidating our hypothesis. You know, eight out of 10 startups fail, and that's because they have a product that nobody wants. People just love to make shit because they just like, it's easier to make it than find out that nobody wants what you're making. It's unbelievable. Um, and so we want to validate that we are on the right track sooner than later. And so to validate, we need to measure. We need to be honest and pick a single key metric that is the one that really matters to show that we have traction, that show that we're getting signal, right? This is a picture of a printed prototype gun, a 3D gun. But it's the idea that you're going to like point your solution prototype at your target hypothesized customer and see if they're jumping out of their seats or if they're saying, wow, this is so neat. You're not pitching to them. You're getting them to say, yeah, this is something I want. So when we were trying to test, when, you know, I teach, uh, as I mentioned, I teach classes. So I have 40 startups every semester. I have 40 startups I'm overseeing right now because every student has to come up with a product idea that they validate. And so the product idea, I had two students working on Airbnb for weddings, so they had to create a prototype. And so they went from storyboard to just comps. We don't need wireframes. Like, who's going to show a wireframe to a customer? It's like, ugh, that's a sketch. They can't really conceive of it. And it's, if you know Photoshop, just mock it up, steal it from a bunch of other places. So we stole from Airbnb, because we're just playing with ideas and putting them together in new ways. So the concept with, we're going to do an easy search. Uh, we're looking for a wedding on the beach. So there we can see all the spots of here are the possible rich, richy, rich houses. And we can filter by Garden Estate, Oceanfront. You know, we just took the Airbnb content out and put ours in. And we created these screens, beautiful content, and this concept of affordable packages, because that's another pain point with weddings, is where are you going to get the food if you have a venue? It's catered. So we came up with different smaller franchises that would deliver the food and bring the cost down. And then we was like, well, what about all the people? We showed a prototype to some customers, or excuse me, to hypothesize customers, some brides who are getting married. And they said, well, when we go see the venue, you know, we, we need to see the venue before we, we book it. Like, there's no way we're having a wedding at someone's house and not seeing it first. But that's not how Airbnb works. Airbnb is good for certain things, but it, that's so we were like, well, let's take a different mental model. So we stole from Apple. Their genius bar, you go and you make an appointment. So here you make an appointment for a tour. So we took that screen, swapped our text in there, and then boom, at the very end is the price transparency. And it was basically the prototype was six screens that we showed to our hypothesized user. We ran an ad in Craigslist. We had screener questions to make sure that we were reaching out to people who were actually getting married. We made sure, because we were offering them $25 or $50, then made sure that, you know, when's your wedding? How, you know, asked them questions to make sure they weren't just trying to scam us. And then we met them at a cafe as opposed to a usability lab or a co-working space or their house or on the street, a nice relaxed environment in a cafe where we would show them the prototype and start with problem interviews and making sure so how are you solving your problem right now? What are the, where are you looking for a venue? And ask them questions that are relevant 
to the product, and then all of a sudden you whip out the solution, say, I've been thinking about this idea, I'm curious to your thoughts, and please tell me the truth, because I really need the honest truth. Have you ever heard of Airbnb? And that's actually a screener question, yes, because you need them familiar with the Airbnb mental model of renting a stranger's house. And then you show them the prototype and you walk them through these different screens to find out if they would buy in to not just the user experience. This isn't usability testing. This is value prop testing. This is figuring out if your business model is even going to work. Because otherwise, once again, you're wasting your life by making products that nobody wants. So here's a real world example. I had this guy on the left. He's a very rich software engineer in Los Angeles. Um, his son became a drug addict. He bounced in and out of drug rehabs, and he kept realizing these drug rehabs were filled, run by lying liars who would just like take all his money, and his son would go in there and they'd slip him cocaine, and it was just a nightmare. And so he's like, I can solve this problem with the two-sided matching system. I can come up with treatment centers and, and with good reviews, and I can figure out um, how to connect with these people who need to find treatment centers and put them together. And he created a website, and he had it out there. He spent a million dollars on it, and nobody used it ever. They'd come there, and they'd bounce away. So then he came to my company and said, please do our user experience, Jamie. And I looked at it, and not only was it ugly, but I was like, this thing's not going to work probably because I don't think people would use it the way it is. And I couldn't really argue with him without empirical evidence. Once again, it's my opinion against his. So we said, let's create a prototype and show it to these users and hear what they say. And so that same process I just showed you of screening people, making sure they were real drug addicts who paid money to go to real drug rehab centers. There's a real drug addict with his back to us. There's me on the left asking him, laughing. Huh? I'm like, like asking him questions like, what was the experience like? Let me show you this prototype of how it would be booking a rehab with this system. And then what we heard after eight hours of interviews in a cafe to my stakeholder's face was I would never book a rehab center over the internet, ever. He's like, I got to go there. I got to look at it. I got to walk around. I got, and, and it, unlike showing a venue in somebody's house, if you send someone who wants to go to a rehab center to a rehab center, Rehab Center will negotiate with them and steal that customer away from us. So it didn't work. His business model would not work in this way. He ultimately had to pivot from a B2C model to a B2B model, but we stopped him in his tracks within six weeks from redesigning the user experience of the website by having him hear directly from the hypothesized customers, this is something I wouldn't do. I'm sorry. Over and over again. And once again, another toolkit in my toolkit, another toolkit in my toolkit <laughs> is another spreadsheet where you're collecting evidence and trying to track it in the cloud so that everybody could see it. Because sometimes we'd be interviewing several people in a cafe. And then killer UX is this idea that you need to make something that's just amazing to use. It can't just be vanilla ice cream average UX. It has to be really knock it out of the park. And this is, these are the features that you're going to hear by doing all of these other things, by looking at the competitors and poaching ideas. And so if you look at Waze, like this is so different from Google Maps. You know, with, it's cartoony, it's silly, but heck yes, I love reporting that I see a cop on the road and letting people know. Um, it's fun. It's like a, game of, a gamification of driving around Los Angeles. This is killer UX, you know, this idea that I open the app and here I am at one bar in Los Angeles and I see, oh, there's guys everywhere. Of course, I'm just going to push this button, get picked up, there's the route, and then $4 later, I'm at another bar. I mean, it's changed the way I can now go out at night and not worry about it. Did I have two glasses of wine? I shouldn't drive. There's something that's changed my life with these incredible interfaces to make it so much better. Tinder, another really funny mental model. Um, that actually isn't uh, a date of mine. That's my brother. But um, I changed the picture not to get sued. You know, but I could say, do I like Greg? Swipe left, swipe right. And then it's a match. There's us. And we can immediately start making a plan for a date. And this concept of immediacy and swiping left and right, now everybody's tindering. They're borrowing that mental model. And Tinder is an interesting business case because they started out of, out of USC, where I teach. 
They did a pilot program at a university and just tested it out in a small market before they scaled. And so all of these ideas are, are with a lot of these companies is them looking at the competitors and saying what's wrong and what's right. And you, so you go to your feature, you know, the features that you've looked at and you start comparing them and saying, well, here, this is an example of a product where for an ebook, and I wanted to see how they highlight. So I just grabbed a bunch of screens, seven different ebook readers, and saw seven different ways to highlight and picked the best one. You know, saved a lot of time of wireframing and rewireframing. Instead, I like, here's, I had my UX designer do all these screen grabs, and then we looked at it and said, this seems the most common pattern, the best practice, and the easiest one. Let's do it that way. You know, the web's been around for 20 years. It's not that complicated. You come up with a value prop and you're not sure which way to go, it's not that hard to do an A-B test. So many products, it's like no money. Put them out there, try different versions, and, tab, and then see which ones get traction, which ones people are bouncing. Got it? So basically, you know, when you're thinking of trying to create products that you're getting people to get all the way, you know, from the top to the bottom, that's doing funnel conversion. And this is growth hacking, which is a whole other thing that I uh, suggest you go look at um, and search on the web growth hacking because it's all about acquiring customers and getting them activated, uh, keeping them retained, and having them evangelize for your product so that you have a product that sticks in the marketplace. Because killer UX equals better conversion. At the very end of our product experience, we want happy customers or paying customers. That's what success looks like. So in recap is a unique kick-ass experience uh, aligned with the right business model can define a disruptive product. It helps the entire team and the stakeholders reach a shared product vision for greater efficiency. And then by doing everything you can to validate your user experience strategy, you, you reduce the risk that you're wasting your life making things that nobody wants. So if you're interested in my toolkit, feel free to go to userexperiencestrategy.com. It's for free. You don't have to buy the book. You click the link that says download the toolkit, and it sends you a link to the Google Cloud uh, spreadsheet, and you can start using the tools yourself if you think they sound interesting for empirical user experience design. If you have any questions, please email me. Please connect with me on LinkedIn. I brought about 13 or 14 books that I'd love to sell to you at my cost um, and autograph if you're interested and not carry back to Los Angeles today in two hours. And um, thank you so much, everybody, for your time.